May I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you know that Mark liked sandwiches? No, not the type involving two slices of bread and the filling reputed to have been invented by the fourth Earl of Sandwich so he could eat while continuing his card game. But the gospel writer's fondness of taking two slices of one story and tucking some juicy item between them, this is exactly what we find in today's gospel story. But before unpacking this sandwich further, let's remind ourselves of some of Mark's gospel characteristics. I'm indebted to Richard Burridge in his book, Four Gospels, One Jesus, which some of you know I'm quite fond of that book, for his description of Mark as a bounding lion, a fearless creature whose bold actions lead him into conflict. Like Aslan in the Narnia books, he rushes on and on, never missing a footing, never hesitating. Mark is a man in a hurry. In his short gospel, he's no time for Jesus' birth narrative, just arrives fully grown, of indeterminate age from Nazareth, to be baptized by John in the Jordan. For Mark, brevity and clarity is important. Like Lewis's lion, Aslan, he bounds along, telling us all about the Messiah. So with this in mind, let us return to today's gospel story. At the beginning of this episode and at the end of this episode, we have two slices of the misguided concerns of close family relatives for Jesus. They think that this sensible, home-loving carpenter has taken leave of his senses. Imagine giving up a steady job like that. And worse again, now being investigated by these important men from Jerusalem. To their way of thinking, his insanity must be due to some form of evil possession. At the end of the today's reading, we see these relatives once more, this time insensitively interrupting his teaching. Clearly, they do not recognize his greater calling, that he must be busy about his father's business. Here is a warning to us that we must be on our guard about dismissing a person's supernatural callings. Many who the church now calls saints have been labeled misguided or at worst, insane in the past. Mark pulls no punches about the meat in the sandwich. The religious experts of Jerusalem are painted for it as deliberately obstinate, even malicious, in the way they misinterpret what Jesus is doing. Readers know that Mark's story is heading towards Calvary and is offering clues to how that outcome was reached. As Mark sees it, the experts are so consumed by their malice that they miss the irony of a devil casting out devils. They say Jesus is in league with Beelzebub and working with his power. Jesus looks at their accusations from three points of view. Jesus asks first, how can Satan cast out Satan? Yet you admit I'm casting out devils. Are you saying that Satan is rebelling against himself? You can't have it both ways. Secondly, Jesus portrays himself as the stronger power who's broken into Satan's territory to free the souls once possessed. And thirdly, he gives a stern warning that the deliberate obstinacy is flying in the face of God. It is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and the deliberate rejection of God's will cannot be forgiven. It's a strong message. Mark, the roaring lion, is never afraid to portray this aspect of Jesus' teaching. Those who reject God's message and call are putting themselves outside the range of forgiveness. We might recall at this point two points from John's Gospel. He came to what was his own and his people did not accept him. John 1.11 and the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. John 3, verse 19. It's interesting to note that Richard Burridge comments that this episode is too strong for Matthew and Luke, and they seek to combine this incident elsewhere in their Gospels. 
Similarly, they choose to omit this section about Jesus' family, considering him mad. Although they do include some references to it, but neither link it to this event. Mark in, verse, Mark in chapter 12 and Luke in verse 8, if you want to have a look. How then does this relate to the 21st century world in which we live? Importantly, we should be aware that in our society there are many people who've not heard the message of the gospel. Ignorance is not a rejection of God's forgiveness. As Christians, it's our duty to share the love of God with those we meet. One of the things that stops people confessing the truth about God can be family pressure. We see that at work in today's gospel. What other people think has a powerful influence on us, and sometimes breaking through it to follow truth and conscience can never be easy. I wonder if his mother and brother were hurt by these words. They probably were. But suppressing the truth out of shame or fear, even hurting someone's feelings, can be a dangerous path. There are, of course, more obvious ways of turning to darkness rather than light, by knowing the opting, opting for justice rather than opting for justice or violence, by pursuing money in a way that makes others suffer, by deliberately abusing God's creation through peddling drugs or crimes against fellow humans that undermine the sanctity of human life. Above all, we need to underline to those around us that everyone is equal in the eyes of God and practice what we preach. Our Christ Christians, our vocation is to live according to God's will and ever conscious of the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Those who set out to live according to God's will are inside God's family circle and will be as close to him as brother, sister, or mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.